I'm Andrew Hewis Fresh. Uh, a Fresh one pretty much everywhere on the internet. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the OpenBSD mindset and when it comes to, th to user experience and how that caused firmware update to come into being, uh, how it started and where it revolved into, um, and where we are now. Uh, so uh, first off, why am I the one who's here? Um, well, my main laptop is an X220, but I left that one at home and I brought this from 2011. This, uh, left it at home and brought my newer um, 2013 T440S uh, that some, I didn't actually get that long ago. but. Um, it's not, I don't you know, upgrade my laptops too often, and so I don't really run into this problem where, uh, but it is something that new users to OpenBSD will hit, and so it's something that uh, does matter to me when I, when I hear about it. And the reason I know about it, though, is that uh, Theo does test out a lot of laptops to make sure that they work and um, regularly does this, and he noticed that this was a problem, um, and regularly when he'd get a new laptop or there'd be a new release or there'd be something that he was testing out, he would uh, mention this still doesn't work. And what doesn't work is that you would uh, do the OpenBSD install. Uh, you would say, yes, I would like to start X when I, uh, when I reboot. And then you'd reboot, but X didn't start. Um, and I was like, well, you just have to restart again, and then it works. So how hard could it be to make it uh, work uh, the, on that first boot? And so I started looking at it, and um, that's why I'm here. So why is this a problem that it doesn't work on the first boot? Well, uh, the big problem is that manufacturers are uh, cheap, and they figured out they could save money by not putting storage directly on their devices and making you fill up your hard drive with all of this firmware rather than them providing storage for it for their own stuff. Um, and so now the OS has to load the firmware for you, and that's uh, kind of annoying, but I guess it's better than the other option where maybe they flash the firmware onto the uh, device and either you can't flash it at all or you have to install Windows or uh, some other operating system to be able to flash the device, which I know has been a problem in the past. Unfortunately, now that they uh, have separated the hardware from the firmware, they now put a separate license on that firmware um, that uh, OpenBSD has to interact with now as the operating system that's going to be loading it. Um, you know, previously, like that, I said, when it was shipped on the hardware, people didn't care what the license was for that. They didn't even think about it or think about that there was probably software on there. Um, and for a while, after this sort of became a big thing, people really did care a lot about that. Um, and there are people that still really care about that. Uh, recently, we, I attended the FOSSI conference in Portland, uh, and they had an entire separate uh, 802.11b 2.4 gigahertz network because that was that's the only uh, Wi-Fi standard that actually has devices with firmware that is uh, free software or something along those lines. And so they still do that. So while OpenBSD cares a lot about licensing, they're uh, more they care more about what runs on the actual processor and, and part of the as part of the OS rather than the pieces that run on that separate hardware. Uh, so the, the thing that they care about is whether the firmware itself can be, how, how the distribution is rather than how the source is. Um, manufacturers, on the other hand, theoretically care about selling more hardware, but they also care about whether or not they uh, um, about making their lawyers happy, and the lawyers want to restrict as many things as they can. Um, so there is a conflict here uh, that, we're, that we have to deal with. Um, I've gotten several emails from people uh, in the past telling me that Perl, because what I do in OpenBSD projects is mostly keep Perl up to date, uh, the Perl doesn't use the 
GPL and doesn't belong in source slash GNU. So I was really glad when we uh, redefined GNU to have a new meaning in, in the source tree. Um, but that indicates that we have several things in there that are have unacceptable license in the base system. And but we do have but we, there is a limit there, and there are many things that uh, maybe people would really like to have, but we aren't but it aren't going to be imported because uh, made part of the base system because of their license. Uh, things that use the CDDL or the GPL v3 have never been uh, acceptable and imported, and uh, they are. Uh, now, while we will upgrade things that use uh, older versions of the GPL that are part of base, uh, they do not import anything new, uh, or we do not import anything new that's part of base that has a uh, GPL license and some other things. You can see the details on the policy page there. So there's some firmware, and a lot of firmware actually, that has a license that allows distributing it in a free enough way that it's included in the base system, and it comes in the base sets, and it, when you install uh, OpenBSD, it's just part of the system. Um, and it, and it, all of that hardware just works. Um, but some firmware, uh, the license is not uh, such that it will allow that, uh, allow us to distribute it. Uh, along with the base system. Um, but fortunately, the, a lot of those that, are, that, are, uh, that I'm going to be talking about, um, they are allowed to be distributed, but not quite as freely. So we can put those, uh, do those differently. And these are mostly Wi-Fi cards and graphics uh, cards, uh, but also like the Intel chipsets and a lot of uh, different machines have a firmware that uh, is needed to be loaded, installed separately outside of the system, or outside of the base system, in addition to what's in the base system. It can get better. Uh, Kevlo uh, emailed or talked to somebody at Realtek and said, hey, what you say you want, want to do, which is allow open source, soft, open source operating systems to use your uh, firmware and distribute it and uh, make your hardware work in, in open source uh, operating systems doesn't match up with what the license actually says. Um, and he here's some of the ways that uh, it doesn't work. That. And somehow talked to the right people there, and the people that he talked to had the power to do it, and now the real tech software is, or real tech firmware is uh, in a more, it got, got a new license, and we can include it in the base system, which actually was kind of a pain for me because. Uh, normally the port system in the port packages, or if anything moves from the from port into the base system, uh, it's also it lives in user local rather than in, in the main system, and so you can just delete that package and then not have anything to reinstall. But with the firmware, we'll see that everything, whether it's system firmware, firmware that ships with the system, or firmware that you got uh, through firmware update, lives in Etsy firmware. Uh, to, because it needs to be on the root file system and everything. Uh, so uh, it was a little bit of a complication to be able to unregister the package and say you or unregister the firmware and say it wasn't installed anymore when it still was installed because it now is moved to the base. So, uh, but now we've done that hard work to make that work. So if you know somebody at one of these companies that provides not free uh, not quite free enough uh, firmware, you should talk to them and get them to let us move it to the base system so that I can use this part of the code a little more. Anyway, we still wanted to be able oh, to run OpenBSD on modern hardware, even though all of these manufacturers were uh, providing this firmware that maybe wasn't uh, acceptably licensed to move into base. Um, and people still needed to be allowed to use OpenBSD for whatever it was, or whatever purposes they want, um, which is one of the uh, goals of the, pro of the project. And that means that, uh, that, that maybe they don't get to use all of the features or all of the things that OpenBSD can do, but you know that's uh, that, that, that's okay because most of us don't have to suffer with that. 
Um, so in the beginning, there was nothing. There was no, there were no, we didn't support any of this uh, hardware that uh, needed these firmwares that couldn't be distributed with the base system. And so that hardware, whatever it was, uh, for Wi-Fi cards or things like that, just weren't supported. And that was super annoying because more and more laptops and more and more hardware was coming out with uh, this sort of firmware. So back in 2011, we started packaging firmware uh, into packages like uh, just a, uh, like uh, the ports and packages system. They would just build packages for the firmware. You do a package add for that firmware, and then that device could work. Um, unfortunately, of course, that meant that you had to like know that you had a piece of hardware that wasn't working right, and be able to look in the D message and say, "Oh, look, here's this firmware that, or this device that says it's not working, and here's the driver for it, and convert that to be the package name." And it's not a huge amount of work, but it's not not a great uh, experience for people who just want uh, want stuff to work. So. Uh, Alexander Hall uh, wrote a small wrapper uh, around uh, package ad that scanned the D message for you, figured out what uh, hardware was missing firmware, and would package ad all of that firmware. That happened really quickly after uh, the packaging started happening. And that worked great for a while. It uh, was actually run in as part of the first boot after you installed which is why uh, you got to do that first reboot before X would start, is you would start up, boot up the laptop. You would run this uh, utility to install the firmware, and then uh, things would work on the next reboot. Uh, I do want to mention that before my rewrite, uh, it was incorrect, incorrectly, FFW update man page was incorrectly in section one, so if you type FW or man FW update and it gives you the section one man page, that one's no good. You should delete it and get the one that's in section eight. Um, so uh, a few years later, um, Mark SB rewrote the scanning tools and stuff and integrated them more directly into the uh, packaging system, and that meant that uh, he could tag, we could tag the firmware as being a special type of package. And so if you deleted, if you did something and you tried to use the regular package tools to delete it, or like sometimes you would say, oh, I just want to delete all of my packages, uh, it would skip um, deleting any of those firmware that would be there. And you had to ask special to, to delete those using the firmware update tool. And that improved the user experience because most of the time, because this firmware update runs automatically at the, uh, on the first boot after an install, if you accidentally deleted the firmware, all of a sudden things wouldn't work and you wouldn't necessarily know why. So this made the user experience just a little bit better. And if you did need to install a firmware separately, it was the same, much closer to the same user experience uh, as using package add and other package tools that uh, existed. So if you look at all the timeline here, kind of guesstimating, it's probably going to need to be another rewrite uh, before too much longer. But hopefully, uh, it'll be a little while. Um, so how do we fix the experience even better, even more, to make things uh, do it? And this is kind of what OpenBSD does, is continually look at what sharp edges there are, what things aren't working as ideally as they'd like, and start polishing those rough edges off and um, making things better. So like I said, these initial tools ran uh, in the rc.firsttime script right after first boot, um, which meant that it didn't work until the second boot. Um, and that led uh, to that issue with having to restart before X would work. Um, but since we can't include the firmware in the base system, uh, base sets, but we need it available when the kernel tries to start the driver, where can, how can we do that? Well, we could teach the kernel how to load drivers or load firmware over the internet somehow, um, but that's unlikely to happen. Uh, EFI is really fancy now. Maybe we could convince the bootloader that 
uh, it should go download this firmware and, and have it available. Um, but that is not very uh, compatible because n not all of the systems that OpenBSD runs on, runs on uses EFI, and definitely some of the one, uh, them that exist don't have a flexible enough boot uh, process to be able to uh, do that sort of thing. So what we have left is doing it somehow in the installer. Uh, but why weren't we doing that already? Well, uh, we can talk about that, but uh, fortunately, um, the packaging format for OpenBSD packages that the firmware is in are very simple. Um, so it's theoretically possible to, to do it in the installer. Unfortunately, it's not quite as simple as just downloading and extracting this tarball that the package is. Um, and up until this point, uh, that Perl package, Perl, the, Perl pa the package manager written in Perl that I was talking about is the only thing that actually dealt with that, with the, data, the package database. Um, so we don't have anything uh, there in the installer that will talk to the package database. Um, but at least in the installer, we don't have to deal with multiple users at the same time. So we have some uh, benefits that we can use uh, to make things easier for us. So why can't we use that open uh, that pa regular package manager in the uh, on, from the installer? Um, well, the installer is kind of like a live system, um, but it's really just enough to actually do the install. It does include all of the tools necessary to do an install, and well, that generally means that uh, somebody who's motivated can use that installer to, uh, who image to boot and recover an image, uh, recover a system that has been uh, broken somehow. Most of the stuff is there just for the install and a little tiny bit for that uh, recovery process. Um, but the Installer needs to fit on a floppy disk because we do still ship some architectures that have floppy images. And Perl doesn't fit on a floppy disk, uh, even by itself. Um, and the other option might be to use the, to install Perl from the base sets and then run it, run the one that we installed. But unfortunately, there's no guarantee that the kernel that we booted the installer with that the Perl that it got installed is compatible with uh, that kernel because OpenBSD likes to change things. Um, so we couldn't do so we couldn't just use that uh, firmware update in the in the installer. And choosing not to add complexity uh, where it's not needed, and keeping these limitations uh, in place in the installer and in other places in OpenBSD. Is I think one of the reasons that to me OpenBSD's installer is one of the best. Um, you know, on the other side, if you try and just like do what add add whatever things or make it easy, uh, sometimes that leads to things being less easy at, over time. Without if you don't think about it, uh, maybe uh, you end up with an installer that will no longer work over a serial console, or maybe it takes more than ten minutes to actually install a system. Um, Maybe uh, you can't just install it by holding down the enter key. You never know. It could happen in some other operating system, but I think OpenBSD is safe. And I want to go down a little side trip here, um, because this is one of my favorite things about OpenBSD and one of the reasons that makes me really love the project, um, is that they really spend time thinking about whether a feature that they're going to add or that might, they potentially might add, is worth the complexity that it brings. And even better, they look at the complexity that's already there and try and think about ways that they can get rid of it, that they can remove it, that they can hide it, that they can uh, make things simpler. Uh, we used to have a Bluetooth stack in, in, in OpenBSD, and it was uh, specific, uh, uh, written by an OpenBSD developer. And, but nobody had stepped up to maintain it for quite a while. And so it was 
not working, you know, it didn't support newer things and it didn't work very well anymore. And so rather than, and since nobody was stepping up to fix it, they were, they said, well, it doesn't work. It's not bringing, uh, it, it's not providing enough utility. We're just going to delete it. Um, sometimes that's the case that just, it just will go away or won't be imported. But sometimes they find uh, that uh, there's something that, 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 that we need to replace it with something, like with moving from sudo to do as, where the complexity of sudo got so, got, got so large that it was, just wasn't comfortable fitting into the base system. And so uh, said you rewrote wrote do as to provide something with simpler uh, interface and simpl being simpler. Or the other option is maybe it's just so complicated that it gets removed or, or the license changes. And so uh, with the Apache project, uh, they went from Apache 1 to Apache 2 and changed the license to a license that was not one that was uh, that we wanted in base. And so that got replaced eventually. Not, I, I think there was at least one uh, release that didn't have a web server in it. But it got replaced with HTBD. Um, in any case, there's lots of things that could become a syscontrol knob to be able to change things. But, a lot, but instead of just saying, going the easy route and saying, oh, I'll just put a knob there and let people change it, uh, they, say, they think about it and say, well, how, do I, how can I make that not a thing? Can I just pick a value that is the best value? Uh, or maybe if they put it in, they realize over time that, oh, well, everybody sets it to this value, and so we'll just set it to that value. Maybe it depends on this other value, and if you change this one, you always change that one. You change them together. So you can remove one of them and base the value of the other off the first. In any case, Making the interface simpler improves the user experience, and I think that's one of the things that I really love about OpenBSD. There's a recent commit by Ingo, uh, where his commit message says something along the lines of, you're not supposed to commit infinite items, infinite numbers of items, but correctness is a virtue. And I think that really reflects the uh, kind of thought process that goes into OpenBSD. So back on track. Um, there are some things that have not yet been removed from OpenBSD. Um, and some of those things are actually part of the install media. And those give us some really impressive capabilities of the things that we can do. This really, it, it amazingly gives us enough features that we're able to implement a very, very simple package manager or package system client. Um, but we needed to be able to say two things to make that uh, possible to do in the short term anyway. Uh, the first one is that there's no dependencies. No firmware can depend on another firmware or some other package or some other thing like that. Uh, they all just have to be standalone. And we don't care about version numbers. All we care about is whatever the version or whatever, we compare this to uh, strings, and if they're not the same, we install the one that's available. So if you manually installed a version 3e to test something, but version 2 was the one that was available in the firmware repository, well, firmware update will happily downgrade you to version 2 um, and not care. And with those two limitations, we can throw away like 99.9% of the complexity that makes up a package system. Uh, and really pro tip, never ever run a package manager. That long tail of complexity is just infinitely fractal and just goes on forever. So what have we got? Um, still, user has been firmware update. Um, but now because that is a shell script, uh, and just a, back to being just a shell script and uh, plain text, 7-bit ASCII file, we don't actually have to include it on the install media. When I mentioned before running package add or firmware update uh, from the install media, well, we can do that now because we have KSH on the install media. And that can be used to run the script uh, that uh, 
perform our update, so long as we make sure that that script only uses the tools that are available on, on the firmware, on the install media. And that means we don't have to worry so much about the size of that script. Uh, and that means we can use a little bit of a nicer syntax, or my preferred syntax, to what, what's, what the installer's written in, because it's also written in KSH, but with a very terse style that uh, is not quite as nice, but usable. Um, this final piece of what we did uh, outside of, um, to, to simplify the firmware update process itself, is um, that we include this uh, user share misc firmware pattern. Um, and it is uh, almost 600 lines now of patterns that not only um, match the driver name, which is what we could match before, uh, which, because when you're installing, when you're, when you've booted off of a full kernel, the kernel recognizes all of the devices that you have and can tell you what, what driver it's going to be using. Uh, and, and so that made detecting what device, what hardware you had much easier. But now we have a C program that uh, builds this uh, list of patterns uh, that gets compiled during a release. And it, it, it contain it looks at all of the things that the kernel will recognize and what they will appear as in the D message so that we can now recognize all of the drivers uh, that will exist on the in the install kernel, uh, not just a full not not just a full kernel that doesn't have all the drivers on it. And many thanks to Theo and Arnaghi for uh, writing that for me and figuring out how to get that information out of the system. So this is all written in KSH, OpenBSD's DDKSH uh, fork. Um, and you can actually do all sorts of things in this. You can do bitwise calculations in it. It has uh, integers, so you can do uh, IPv6 manipulation with it. Um, they're only 32-bit integers, so you also have to do math and carry and do stuff. But I didn't have to do that for firmware update. Um, it was just for something else. Um, and those firmware patterns that we're generating are actually FN match glob style patterns. And so KSH matches those out of the D message uh, itself, uh, which make which actually sped up the process of scanning for devices uh, significantly. But you can't still oh, can't pass around arbitrary strings through different uh, external programs and stuff. So it has some limitations. Like there's no networking. Should Shell be able to access the network? Seems uh, odd. But we have FTP in the, on the install kernel, or on the install image. And that actually also includes, uh, it's also a HTTP client, well, an HTTP Git client. <clears throat> it doesn't have the ability to do any of the other HTTP verbs like post or uh, put or patch or any of those. Um, I do have a helper that works with uh, Netcat and the HTTP Tiny Perl module uh, to do uh, TLS communication, HTTP communications with uh, just a tiny little piece of uh, Perl module. Uh, but that's not also not part of the base system. Um, theoretically, there's a project to get a TLS library bundled with Perl. Um, which might make it for the 5.42 release, in which case we would again have uh, the ability to do those other HTTP verbs, but not from the installer. Um, we did have that in the past, but another thing that got deleted because it wasn't worth the complexity was links. <coughs> so although FTP has uh, been pledged and unveiled, it's still an older, older code base with lots and lots of features and lots and lots of uh, dirty corners, um, and it talks to the network. So we don't want to uh, run it as root, and firmware update has to run as root because it needs to be able to install things into slash Etsy and, and stuff. Uh, and there is a HTTP client 
uh, in the source tree, but it doesn't get installed because the bugs for that haven't been worked out yet. So what we do is we drop privileges uh, when running SCP using either to SU or do as. Um, we actually use both, uh, depending on whether we're in the installer or not. Because in the installer, we have a, a feature trim down version of do as that really works pretty much like uh, SU uh, in that it doesn't use a config file and it doesn't do a bunch of other things that the full version can. But it allows you to change users, um, or at least allows root to change users. Um, but when we're running in the full system, do as could be broken by the, that config file. Somebody could configure it not to allow uh, firmware update to work. And so, uh, firmware, so we use SU uh, when we're on the full system. And then once we've downloaded that, we can verify the, what we downloaded is signed and trusted. And to do that, we use Signify and SHA-256 uh, that are both also on the part of the installer. They're used uh, to verify the <coughs> install images. Um, we do have to use both of these directly because uh, also compiled out of each of them is the dash capital C flag, which actually checks the, compares the image man itself to the, compares the checksum that's in the file to the uh, file that's on disk. So we have to generate the checksum and look in the file for it. Um, but we can use Signify first to verify the, the signature uh, on the firmware sha 6sig works. And the way we do that is we hope you've verified that you downloaded an installer image uh, before you use it. And that installer image uh, includes the base set public key. So the base sets are all signed with the base set private key, which we, can then, which we then get verified with the base set public key. Inside of that base set is the firmware uh, image public key. So now that's been verified, and we can verify that the firmware that we've downloaded, or the SHA-256, uh, the SHA-256 SHA hashes of the firmware that we've downloaded match what somebody signed. This is nearly the same validation that the regular packages use. Um, we don't do quite as much on the deleting side um, yet. Probably get to that eventually. But once it's validated, we can extract that firmware and register it with the package database. To do that registration, Ed is on the um, installer. And uh, though it's mostly, I think, used to do that, that validation or to do that recover, system recovery, um, it's also scriptable. And you can use it to script registering the firmware into the package database by editing the content file and stuff. And I know I said that we weren't using the Perl package manager. Uh, but when we're running not in the installer, when we're running in the, a full uh, system, we actually build that, or we run that. We use Perl to lock the database so that we don't get uh, multiple uh, processes accessing the package database at the same time and causing corruption and stuff like that. And so with that, firmware update is now in the installer, uh, and we can run it from there. Um, but we actually run it a lot. Um, during that install or doing it during an upgrade, we run it from the installer and do it there. But if you're using sysupgrade to do the upgrade, we run it at the start when we, uh, before, the, before rebooting, and we install the firmware for the destination system that you're going to be upgrading to, because that's the same kernel that the installer is going to use, or the install kernel is going to use, uh, because it's a match system. And that means that the installer kernel is more likely to have the firmware that it needs to be able to start up uh, Wi-Fi or whatever it needs to do to download firmware or to download anything that it needs. And 
just in case that didn't all work. And the full kernel has some driver that didn't get detected or some thing that didn't get detected. We still run it from rc.first time to install the firmware that got detected there at the end. Uh, that, that may not have gotten detected inside the install or the installer kernel. And with that, nearly 850 lines of KSH and that's 600 lines of firmware patterns. You mostly, uh, if all goes right, no longer have to reboot after install before, uh, or reboot again after it is installed before X will start. You do the install, start up, and it boots up. It's been doing that since OpenBSD 7.1. Um, the FAC uh, does have some uh, section talking about how to add firmware to the installer in case you're, wi you're going to be installing over Wi-Fi and your Wi-Fi card needs firmware. There's a way to uh, inject firmware into it uh, so that you get a working system uh, without having to have internet on the device that you're installing. Um, you have to have a separate device to do that, but anyway. Um, and I talked apparently really fast or forgot something, but uh, thanks. Um, uh, I did want to mention a couple of things in addition to that. If you ever come to Portland, Oregon, uh, hit me up. We do a pizza social meetup every week, and I could probably talk people into showing up again if you were in town. Um, last year, we had the FOSSI conference. I'm not sure if they're going to do it again, but they want to be like OSCON or FOSDEM or something like that and have different tracks. And Michael Dexter, hopefully we'll mention it at some point, because he convinced them to let us do uh, BSD tracks. Um, we weren't very good at uh, promotion and stuff, so it was not very well attended, uh, or not as well attended as we would have hoped. Uh, so this next time, if they do it, hopefully we'll do a better job on that. He's part of the uh, committee for the BSD can here. So uh, he has some experience now getting that done. So hopefully he does that, and a lot of uh, you all will show up, and we will outnumber the GPL folks that show up. So. Uh, I got plenty of time for questions. Uh, so, how do I come up with the firmware patterns file? So, uh, most of the pattern, or many, am I okay? That's not true. There is a pattern for each driver that just looks at the beginning, that the first characters in the D message for, uh, without the number at the end, and sees if it matches. And that, of course, is the driver name that it's attached to. And that's the easiest way, and that's the way it worked for uh, forever. Unfortunately, like I said, the, in the install kernel, we don't necessarily, the driver isn't necessarily compiled into that kernel, and so it doesn't match. So there are tables somewhere, I believe in a header file, uh, that I can't remember right now, because it's been a while since I looked at it. Uh, the patterns.c in the source tree is only like 25 lines or something. So, uh, But it just grabs a list of, there's this list of devices and strings, or device keys and strings, and we can map those device numbers to what driver they use and put that string as a pattern uh, into, the, into the file. Uh, and so this C program loads those headers, runs through the uh, list of things, and outputs the driver name and the pattern to match. No, it is only in the source tree. It is not installed because uh, it's been tried a few. It's been 
switched on a few times to put it as a, to be installed, but every time we do, there's some something that it won't talk to, some sort of because uh, HTTP is apparently a terribly old protocol and has a lot of corner cases. So <coughs> it really just needs somebody uh, who has time to find all of those kind of, or more of those corner cases so it works more reliably and is ready to uh, fix it for the cases when, it, when people report that it doesn't. I know that there have been uh, questions that th in the installer that they have uh, that that have been wondered if we can remove them yet. Um, I can't recall what those are now, or, uh, but I recall that there was one. There was at least one that recently came up and said, "Do we still need that?" Yes, and it turned out. It wasn't quite time to uh, remove it. Um, I do know on the flip side, uh, I was involved recently with uh, reviewing patches to add full disk encryption support to the installer. Um, so the discussion over the how to integrate the questions for that and not complicate the Installer for people who don't want it uh, was much was significantly longer than the technical part of uh, actually how do you add that uh, piece of code to the installer. So um, that was something that you know was discussed. It, that one was I think it was three questions if you enabled it previously, and then it's now two questions. Something like that. Well, the passphrase asks twice, but. Are there any plans? I mean, I don't know if you have access to the source. Are there any plans to ever make a package manager that's not written in Perl? Um, I think that is unlikely um, because the, like I said, the complexity of dealing with dependencies and with firmware or with version numbers, um, just the creativity of people when versioning their software is quite impressive. And uh, one of the, one of Perl's strengths is dealing with uh, people and, and the mess that they've uh, created. So uh, I think that If someone was were to step up and uh, provide something that worked, it's possible. But I, it, it seems unlikely. All right. 
with that, I think I'm going to say thank you to BSD Can for having me, and thank you all for coming and listening. And thanks.